So this was not relevant to what we're going to talk about today. It's sort of relevant to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but it's for the future use. So there will be some electives. Uh, we're going to use that data to, to share with you some tactical stuff. So how many of you are at summer day camp for the first time ever? Raise your hand. That's pretty good. How many of you are at your first Georgetown debate summer? This is your first time here. How many of you have been to Georgetown before? Georgetown debate summer. Do we have any three time people? Three time people? Gosh, I used very nice. All right. Uh, this lecture is something that I wanted to do for a long time, and then last year I did it for the first time. When you usually when you go to camp, the first thing that you'll do after you get checked into the dorms and all that stuff is you'll come to a room like this. And someone will give you the topic lecture, and they'll tell you, like, here's what the resolution is, and here's what all the words mean, and here's some of what the apps are, here's the vocabulary, that kind of thing. And all that's really important, obviously. You, one of the big reasons you come here is to learn about the topic, right? That's one of the reasons that debate camp is so important, is you get to spend three weeks, five weeks, seven weeks, however long it is, learning about the topic. But I think that one of the maybe even more important things to do first is get you in the right frame of mind to succeed at camp and to get you just kind of jazzed up and excited about learning at camp and to kind of let you know what could go wrong in the next three weeks or in the next five weeks or the next seven weeks. How many of you, Georgetown is just step one in your summer camp voyage? You're going off somewhere else. You're going to XDI or SDI or something like that. DDI, lots of I. Cool. All right. Uh, as, as you'll see, there's not a lot of, there's not going to be a lot of stuff up here. I'm not huge on PowerPoints, but I've put a bunch of cool pictures. So if you want to look at the cool pictures, you can look at the cool pictures. You can also look at my cool shirt which is uh, an ocean shirt. Uh, so it's after lunch, you're tired, if, you, if you're like falling asleep, or you're getting distracted, just look at the cool pictures, or look at the cool shirt, and then, then you'll be good. All right, this is the second time I've done this. Some of you were here last year. How many of you were here last year and watched this, uh, this lecture? How many of you are thinking like, oh God, I know this already, I'm just gonna cut cards out. No, I wouldn't do that to you. I'm not gonna do the same lecture as last year, but uh, I think that the lecture from last year is pretty good, and it has a bunch of stuff that I'm not gonna talk about today. If you want to watch it, you can go to this thing, or you can just Google this. Uh, and it's not very long, it's like 40 minutes, and you could, you could always put it on double speed or whatever, do it in 20 minutes. Just, I think it's a good refresher. It gives you some, some pretty practical um, tips. But I got new stuff for you this year. So if you're a repeat subscriber like Akash and Ayush and Angelo and the rest of you, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bore you. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is why the Bay Camp is awesome. Isn't that a cool picture? I, I figured it was gonna look awesome on the screen. There's better ones. Uh, debate camp is awesome. How many of you who have been to debate camp before, if you were to describe your experience at debate camp, might have used the word awesome? You go home, you're like, how was debate camp? It was awesome, right? I think that debate camp is awesome, uh, and I think that debate camp is awesome because I get to wear a shirt like this, and no one's going to make fun of me. People are going to be like, that's an awesome shirt, because it's an ocean shirt. Uh, we're all just kind of debate geeks here. All of the students here, uh, even if you're going to debate camp for the first time and you haven't debated for a long time, you like debate. And because you like debate and we're willing to go to debate camp, that means some things about you. It means that you are excited about ideas. It means that you're excited about arguments. It means that you are interested in doing some academic stuff during the summer. It means that you are not just interested in playing video games or in hanging out at the beach or by the pool or whatever, that you want to do something with your mind during the summer, that you get bored uh, when you're not engaging that part of your life. And I think that that's awesome. All the instructors uh, come to summer debate camp, and during the year we have jobs and we have families and we have responsibilities, but here we just get to teach you debate. Uh, and that ultimately is the coolest thing about debate camp. Think about a regular you know, week during the school year. Think about all of the stuff that is on your plate. You have to go to school. You have to do your homework. You have to study for the SAT. You know, Sahil has to do his you know, 10 hours of SAT prep every week or whatever. You have to do other co-curricular activities. A lot of you have jobs or you have volunteer responsibilities. Just think of all of the stuff that you gotta do. If you're you know, junior or senior, you gotta start doing college applications. Just Imagine for a minute how stressful that is and all that stuff that you have going on during the year. Just think about one of the more stressful weeks from the last school year. Now think about debate camp. There's none of that. Your only job during debate camp is to do debate. It's wonderful. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to do your math homework. You don't have to take SAT prep classes. You don't have to write your college resume. Some of you, you know, are probably going to have to do that on the side. But for the most part, summer is a time to just immerse yourself in debate. And it's really awesome because everyone here is doing the same thing. The faculty doing the same thing. Wait till you see Repco uh, get up here in a few minutes and talk about the packet and the topic and relations flight 370. He's going to be super passionate about it. He's going to be super jazzed about sharing that uh, with you because he's in a room 
full of Dominkies who are really interested in that and really excited about that, and it's fun. It's fun to teach you, and hopefully it's fun uh, to learn. That's why I really like debate camp, but I think if you think about it like that, debate camp is your opportunity to escape all of that stuff that you have to do during the year, all of the school and all of the college stuff and all of the jobs and all those responsibilities, and just do debate. Uh, I think that's why I love it. So that's my uh, spiel about why debate camp is awesome. Uh, here's what I want to do. Is anyone a fan of Freakonomics? Has anyone read any of the Freakonomics books? Anybody listen to the podcast, the Freakonomics podcast? I really like Freakonomics. And one of the recent podcasts is about the concept of a pre-mortem. So how many of you know what a post-mortem is? Like you hear that on like CSI or whatever, or some, some medical show. So somebody dies, and we have to do a post-mortem. We have to figure out why they died, what happened. Uh, you could do the same kind of process before something bad goes wrong, and that's called a pre-mortem. And a pre-mortem is when you uh, imagine that what you are about to do has gone wrong, and you try to explain why that thing has gone wrong. So instead of thinking like, well, how might debate camp go wrong, I want you all to just think uh, for a second that it is three weeks from now, it is whatever it is, and debate camp sucked. It was terrible. It was not a good experience. You didn't learn very much. You didn't have a good time. And I want you to think about why that might have happened. So it's three weeks from now, or it's seven weeks from now, or it's five weeks, whenever you're done with the big hand. It sucks. You fail. Explain your failure. Think about that. Why did it suck? Why did you fail? The cool thing about the way we think is that we're really afraid of failure. So we're all really afraid to mess stuff up. Nobody wants to fail at the big hand. Nobody wants to fail in school. Nobody wants to fail their job. Nobody wants to fail the SAT. Right? the college admissions process. But what researchers have found is that if we imagine that we have failed and we kind of resign ourselves to the existence of our failure, we can better think about how that failure might come about. So nobody really wants to think about failing at debate camp. Like, why would you think about that? I'm not going to fail at debate camp. Debate camp's going to be awesome. It's going to go swimmingly the whole time. No, no failure. Not going to think about failure. But if you think about that failure, you can better predict what could go wrong and then you can avoid those pitfalls. There's a um, research psychologist who uh, kind of promotes this idea named Gary Klein. Uh, there's some research into psychology about perspective hindsight that's really interesting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest two ways that you might fail at debate camp. So I'm going to imagine that I'm talking to a student, one of any of you in this room, in three weeks or in seven weeks or however many weeks, and I'm going to explain to you why you fail. And in the process of doing that, I want you to think about these possible failures, but I also want you to think about other ways that you might fail over the next three or five or seven weeks. And I want you to, by thinking about that, figure out a way to avoid those pitfalls. So the first thing that could happen is you could fail because you burned out. I think this is probably the most common thing that happens at debate camp. If you're here, you probably love debate. And if you're here, you probably want to spend a lot of time on debate. The risk is that because you don't have any of those other responsibilities and those other hassles in your life, all of that other stress, that you're just going to throw yourself at debate and you're going to do nothing but debate and you're going to overdo it. And in the process of overdoing it, you're going to get burned out on debate. You're going to lose your passion. You're going to lose the love of debate. You're going to get sick. You're going to get tired. You're going to get stressed. And by the end of camp, you're not going to feel excited like you did this morning. You're going to feel sad and depressed and you're not going to like it anymore. It's going to feel like a job instead of this awesome opportunity to hang out with a bunch of debate geeks and do debate stuff. So the thing that will happen is that you will overdo it at the beginning because we all at this point feel really excited, really energetic. You're going to you know, skip some meals to prep for your practice debates. You're going to stay up really late, hang out with your friends. You're going to try to cut a million cards. You're going to try to do a million speeches. You're going to go to every after lab. You're going to get to lab early in the morning and try to do some more speeches. You're just going to be sprinting for a few days. But that can't last. You can't do that for three weeks, much less five weeks or seven weeks. So you're going to get exhausted and you're going to have to start scaling back, and then maybe you'll get sick, or maybe you'll get uh, overtired and stressed out, and you'll have to take a lab off, or you'll have to take a day off because you got sick, and then it's going to feel like a chore going back to lab. This happens every year in every lab I've ever taught. At least one person, and usually more than one, one person, just overdoes at the beginning, and they kind of ruin the rest of their camp experience. So I want you to think about how that could happen, what that would look like, and what that would feel like if that happened to you. And then I want you to think back and <clears throat> anticipate how you could fix that. How can you check yourself? Do you need a friend? 
to help you kind of monitor how much time you're spending. Do you need a, a bedtime? Do you need to regulate your rest time? Do you need to have a plan for doing something other than debate? So going and playing ultimate frisbee or going and playing basketball or going and doing whatever. Do you need to have a certain uh, day where you go to M Street and go to Chipotle or whatever so that you get away from the campus and you just kind of get away from debate? You need to do that. And the longer that you're at camp, the more you need to do that. So if you're going to go for seven weeks of debate camp, you can't treat this like a marathon or like a sprint. You have to treat it like a marathon, uh, and you have to slow down a little bit. Uh, so that's one way you can fail. Uh, the other way you could fail is because you didn't challenge yourself. This is it's not really the flip side, but it's a different way to fail. So you come here really excited, but you're nervous. How many of you are nervous? Don't raise your hand. Just think to yourself, am I nervous? I think most of you probably are at least a little bit nervous about some aspect of debate camp. Living by yourself, you got a new roommate, you got a new friend group, you got to take care of yourself, and then there's all the stuff about debate. You're nervous about giving a speech, you're nervous about showing your lab leader some evidence that you've cut, you're nervous that you're not going to cut it, you're not going to know stuff, you're going to be behind. I've heard all of those things, and I understand all of those things, and it's reasonable to have all of those fears and anxieties. Even if you're a really accomplished debater, you're still afraid to mess up and to look bad uh, or to not know how to do something and to be exposed to uh, as someone who doesn't know how to do something or isn't great at something. What could happen is that you could let that anxiety and that fear control you so that you're unwilling to kind of put yourself out there and challenge yourself. You're going to kind of settle into a comfort zone, and instead of using debate camp as an opportunity to get better and to grow, not just as a debater, but as a student, as a person, uh, you're going to kind of stay in the corner. You're going to not speak up in lab. You're not going to volunteer for things. You're going to only go for the arguments that you're really comfortable with. You're going to uh, kind of, you know, Whenever there's extra opportunities, you're, you're not going to do that. Whenever uh, there's something that's going to happen in the lab, you're going to kind of maybe go to the bathroom right before the person is picked so that you don't get picked for that. You're going to you know, kind of undermine yourself in advance. Oh, you know, I don't know how to debate critiques. Or, oh, I, I, I don't do topicality. I can't learn that. That's not for me. It'll, what will end up happening is you'll end up you know, sitting on the beach watching debate camp go by, and when it's done, you'll think, God, I wasted that opportunity. Because what usually happens, if you're here for three weeks, by that third week, you get really excited. You're like, Oh, I finally feel comfortable. My lab is nice. You know, I, I've built some confidence. I'm excited. I want to start doing things. And then it's like, oh, camp is over. Well, then you failed. You kind of wasted those first two weeks. If you're here for seven weeks, sometimes it takes even longer. You know, it takes four or five or six weeks. At one point, you'll probably feel comfortable, and you're going to regret not taking those opportunities early in camp to engage and to be active and to you know, put your stuff out there. The cool thing about debate camp, which is different than the regular season, is that there's no winners, right? If you go to you know, some different camps, there's some tournaments. But nobody cares about camp tournaments. Does anyone you know, remember who won the you know, 2005 you know, debate camp tournament? Nobody remembers any of that. It doesn't matter. Right? Most of the debates that you'll be in have no winner. They just have feedback, and they have suggestions. The people that you're competing against during the season are going to be your competitors. They're going to be your opponents. But during the summer, they're your colleagues. They're helping you learn. So the more speeches you do, the more debates you do, the more you work with one another to make the debates better, to make the activities better, to make the lab discussions better, the more you'll learn. So you're all kind of working together. It's in nobody's interest to undermine anyone or to make anyone feel bad or to make anyone feel embarrassed or ashamed or that they're not good enough. It just doesn't make any sense. It's not in anyone's interest. It's not in the interest of the lab group in general. It's not in the interest of the person that's being harassed. And it's not in the interest of the person doing the harassing. So in the same way that you could end up you know, in three weeks or five weeks or seven weeks burning out and thus failing a debate, uh, a debate camp, you could kind of not put yourself out there, you could stay in your comfort zone, you could refuse to challenge yourself, and then in three weeks or five weeks or seven weeks, you will have failed in an entirely different way. There are many other ways that you could fail at debate camp. Uh, and if you watched the, the lecture that I did last year, I have some more kind of specific tips, but I think these are the two um, primary ways that I foresee some of you failing at debate camp. Some of you will, and it's not the end of the world. Um, but if your goal is not to fail at debate camp, kind of think now, how am I gonna mess this up? How am I gonna, how am I gonna ruin this opportunity? Uh, what am I going to regret when I come you know, back next year to debate camp? Or what am I going to regret when I'm at my first tournament about debate camp? What am I going to regret when I'm you know, getting home uh, and mom and dad say, you know, how was debate camp? What am I going to regret? What are my regrets going to be? You know, think about that now, on day one, and then try to fix that so it doesn't happen. A uh, couple of things that I want to tease that I'm going to do more about later in an elective. Um, <clears throat> the first one is about focus. And I think this is really important. Um, there are two kind of tips I'm going to give. The first one so for this slide is about managing your energy and managing your focus. 
Uh, how many of you know stuff about like sleep and sleep cycles and how that works? You like learned about that in school probably? Uh, there's something called an ultradian rhythm or an ultradian cycle. Uh, and it affects our sleep. So people sleep in about 90 minute increments to go through sleep cycles. Uh, but it turns out that that also works during the day. The human body is not a machine, it's not linear. It works cyclically. So we have periods of high energy where we're able to focus and we're able to concentrate. And then we have periods of low energy where we are unable to focus and we are, when we are easily distracted and we need rest. The key to productivity and kind of happiness and just doing a good job at things is to manage your day and to manage your effort so that you are working hard during periods of high energy and taking breaks and resting during periods of low energy. And it's uh, just like with sleep cycles, it turns out that the ideal amount of time to spend focusing or concentrating on something deeply is about 90 to 120 minutes, so an hour and a half to two hours. And the great thing about debate camp is that our schedule is, is generally uh, conformed to the natural way that, that people work. So in the morning, we have our three-hour session. That's about two cycles of hard work with a break in between. In the afternoon, when we have lab, you know, we have four hours, so we have another opportunity for two cycles uh, with a break, you know, maybe several breaks uh, in there. And then evening lab is about two hours, so that's another cycle. So we could do five cycles uh, every day of an hour and a half each time of really hard work. We could, we could really focus, uh, and we could, we could do that uh, five times. That's seven and a half hours. That's, that's a low end, or 10 hours on the high end of focused, concentrated work. That's awesome. Uh, if we could really do uh, seven hours, eight hours, nine hours, something like that, of hard, concentrated work every day at the weekend. Now, some of you aren't going to be able to do it that long, but what some of you are going to do is you're not going to do really any hours of concentrated, deeply focused work during debate camp. You're going to do 10 hours, 11 hours, 12 hours, 13 hours of unfocused, distracted work. And uh, it turns out, and I don't think this should be surprising to anyone, that it's not how long you work at something that determines how much you produce and how successful you are at whatever your project is. It's how intensely you work on that thing. There's a professor here at Georgetown named Cal Newport who has a really cool blog about learning and about studying. Uh, he might uh, come talk to us at some point. So I, I'm going to email him uh, and see if he'd be willing to do that. Uh, but what he says is that what a lot of people think is that the way to measure how much you've done in a day or like how, how well you're doing something is you would multiply the amount of time you have spent on that thing uh, by the uh, thing that you did. So if you did 10 hours of debate work, it's like 10 times. Uh, debate, and I did 10 hours of debate work. I did a great job. I have 10 units of debate work. Already. In reality, it's the amount of time you spent times the intensity with which you work. So if you do 10 hours of debate work at 50%, that means that you've really just done five hours of debate work. And in, in reality, it's even less than that. If you do five hours of highly focused debate work, you, you also get five units of debate work, but you have five hours in which to rest or to hang out with your friends or to have a meal where you're not stressed about the next practice debate or whatever. So it's in your interest to, during the times when you are doing hard debate work, to deeply focus on that debate work and not to be distracted by other things and not to allow yourself to waste that time checking your email and that kind of thing, which is going to be the next point. Uh, what Newport, he boils his advice down to do fewer things, do those things better, and know why you're doing them. And I really like that because I think it works with debate camp. Your instructors are, are excellent. They will prescribe something for you to do. Maybe one day that's cutting cards. Maybe one day that's giving practice speeches. Maybe that's one, one day that's listening to a lecture. Maybe the next day that's doing a practice speech. Whatever they have prescribed for you, they have basically prescribed a cycle of deep focus that can help you become a better debater. And so during the time that you are engaged in that project or in that, uh, that speech or that research or whatever, you should deeply focus on that project, and then you should stop and take a break at the end of the cycle. Uh, and when you take a break, you should truly take a break. So don't work through lunch, don't work through dinner, don't work through the break, because uh, you'll burn out. Your body can't sustain that level of focus. Your mind can't sustain that level of focus. So when your lab has you know, a two-hour research time, don't spend that entire two hours multitasking, uh, working on something else, um, you know, uh, wasting your time. Deeply focus for two hours and then stop, and then take a real break. You know, take, we have awesome... Uh, lunch and dinner breaks here, you get three hours a day to have meals, go outside, walk somewhere, hang out with your friends, get food, just check out a debate, but then when you come back to debate, check back into debate. Don't spend the whole camp just kind of like 50% invested or 70% invested. It's better to spend 70% of your time or 50% of your time deeply focused and 30 to 50% of your time not focused at all than to try to you know, kind of split the difference. 
the last thing is zero notification. And I've read a bunch of stuff about this too. Uh, and I don't, think I, I don't think any of you are really going to do this, but I hope that a few of you at least will try. How many of you just think to yourself and look around you, how many things are currently giving you or could give you a notification? So that means a text message, a Twitter mention, a Facebook update, uh, a Gchat message, an email inbox icon, uh, and I don't even know all the other stuff that you, love, that you use a lot of that. Know, uh, an Instagram thing, whatever. Just think of all the things that at any moment could grab your attention. At any moment, you're listening to this lecture, maybe you're taking some notes, but all of a sudden, boom, your attention has been grabbed. Boom, your attention has been grabbed. And what is it going to say? It's going to say, like, you know, someone has sent you a message. You know, like, why does that need to grab your attention right now? It doesn't. Uh, there is um, this guy, and I don't know how to say his last name, it's Joel Gascoigne or something like that who's the CEO at Buffer.com. And what he says is that when you are deeply focused on work, you need to eliminate all notification. So that means that nothing can grab your attention until you decide to enable that thing to grab your attention. So that means no email, no Facebook, no Twitter, no nothing, and to close your phone and put your phone away so that it is impossible for your phone to grab your attention. Because it turns out that even that like message, that like noise that you hear when your phone vibrates or the feeling that you feel on your leg or wherever, uh, if you have your phone, you're in your lap or in your pocket, just that little thing saps your mental energy and takes your focus away from the deep focus that you need to get good work done, and it's almost impossible to replenish that or to fix that. The same thing is true when you get that little icon on your Gmail or whatever. You're, you're cutting cards, you're deeply focused, you're reading an article, you're, you're in the zone, and then all of a sudden, a little one next to your Gmail icon. You're like, oh my god! And it's like, you know, Amazon.com recommends this book. I, you probably don't, I don't know what you all get. Abercrombie and Fish recommends these pants. Uh, did you really need to see that right then? I don't think so. You were doing debate work during that time. During a rest period when you don't have a lot of mental energy and you're just kind of screwing around on the internet or you need a break, certainly look at the Abercrombie ad or look at the text that I sent you or whatever. It's not urgent. Uh, Gassioni uh, quotes this person, Preston Nee, and it's a quote that I really like. Don't confuse the urgent with the important. Just because you got a notification doesn't mean it's more important than what you're doing. Just because it just happened doesn't mean it's important. Uh, when you're at debate camp, you have a limited amount of mental energy. The more mental energy you all are spending, and I know that that's what you're doing now, and I know that that's just kind of how you live your life, the more mental energy you invest in all these notifications and in all of these distractions, the less you have to spend on debate. And if you try to spend all of your mental energy on debate, but still have all these notifications, you will get burned out, and you will lose focus, and you won't be able to cut as many cards. Uh, this morning, so on, where's so on? So I'm said that he's going to set a goal, and I love this goal, that every day he's going to cut like 10 cards. I think he said 10 or 15 or something like that. That's an excellent goal. But I guarantee that Soham could cut 10 cards faster if he turned off all of his notifications and put his phone like in his backpack on the other side of the room and just spent the 45 minutes or whatever to cut those 10 cards, and then he would be done, and then he would have 45 minutes to watch Netflix or to hang out with his friends or to go for a walk or to play basketball or whatever he does for fun. And he's going to end up feeling much better at the end of camp. He's going to get more done. He's going to feel more refreshed. And then the next day, when he has a practice meeting, he's going to perform better. Or when he has a speech, he's going to perform better. And three or four or five or six weeks into camp, he's going to be still feeling good, but he's still accomplishing his goal. If he instead spends two hours or three hours just like sort of cutting cards, for a while he might get to the eight or the ten or the fifteen or whatever he's shooting for, but he's going to be exhausted. And he's not going to have any time to do anything else. And that's just going to be kind of hanging over him at all times. He's going to, you know, oh, i got to do this, but first got to watch this video. Uh, i got to cut another card, but first got to finish this chat. Oh, and now i got this notification from you know, Kosh just texted me that he needs, you know, he wants to tell me a joke or something. Oh, i got to respond. Oh, and now I'll go back to cutting cards. Where was I? So, I challenge you, uh, the, the reason I picked this picture is, like, it's very distracting. If your mind looks like that and is, like, trying to see all those fish, how in the world are you supposed to get anything done? You're just, like, very, like, if you're looking at this shirt for too long, how can you get any debate work done? Eliminate all that stuff. Give it a try. Uh, obviously, you know some of you aren't going to want to do this. But if your goal is really to have more free time and to feel better throughout the course of the day camp uh, and to get more done, then that's what I really suggest that you do. Uh, eliminate all those notifications. No, nothing can grab your attention when you're focused. But then when you're done focusing, don't don't try to do any more of it. Check your phone. Check your Facebook. Do whatever. Uh, 
Um, but it's your decision then. It's not the, the phone's decision or the app's decision. Uh, it shouldn't control you. All right. So uh, Will's going to come up in a, in a minute and talk about uh, the packet, which is very exciting and, and super awesome. As you're listening to his lecture, as you're listening to the lecture tomorrow and the next day, I want you to consciously be thinking about, all right, how can I focus? How can I uh, concentrate and give my full attention to the lecture when you're in lab? How can I give full attention to whatever we're doing uh, for the duration of that activity? And then when you get a break, you know, take a real break. Uh, but when you're working, work hard, when you're taking a break, take a real break. Uh, and I think if you do that, you'll have a much happier uh, summer debate camp. So think about how I fail. Think about how excited you are today and how sad it would be in three weeks or five weeks or seven weeks, it didn't work out. Uh, and take steps today, not in three weeks or five weeks or seven weeks, uh, to make that right. Uh, and hopefully, you will love the big camp just like I do. Maybe you can even get one of these cool shirts. All right, that's it.